All right, guys, welcome back. Got an interesting conversation today. Uh, another, another LA. You know, the 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 folks that are, my friends out in Los Angeles are always sending me sending me interesting people to chat with that are kind of in the Hollywood space or doing some really innovative stuff. We've had a few come on that they've really built these amazing platforms. Uh, I think one of them had like the largest Facebook show or Facebook watch show in the world. Really incredible stuff. And so we're going to talk about that again today. We got another guest. It's in those circles, right? So really, really fascinating stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, content creation, right? A lot of people struggle with, okay, I have this idea for this content, but where do I go? What platform do I build it on? And how do I monetize it, right? And so they don't know how to turn a passion into a monetizable livelihood, right? And so Mr. Jason Berger is going to join me today. And we're going to talk about just that. Uh, so Jason, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing well, man. Doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited yeah. to be here. Yeah, man. So I'm curious. Yeah. You know, this is why we always start the show, just to talk more about you, right? I, I gave a, a kind of a high, high level view of who you are and the work you're up to. I know, you know, I said the Hollywood circles and stuff like that. So what led you to doing that? What is the work you do now? Kind of how did that evolve? You know, and it's, you know, the, the elevator pitch of all of it, I guess. Yeah, I think the elevator pitch is, is that like, I've always been fast. I mean, my dad took us uh, to movies as kids and so mm -hmm. we would go to a double feature and uh, would just I had a love of pretty much every genre mm -hmm. um, and so I think that I always wanted to be in the business somehow yeah. and so uh, when I came out here I basically learned every position that I could because I just wanted to know what I wanted to do like I didn't yeah. know did I want to be a camera guy did I want to do sound did I want to do grip and electric did I want to do editing did I want to do producing did I want to do directing and so on uh, or writing and um, so I just basically went and, and at a very, very low level, <clears throat> went and just did whatever I could in every single department. Mm. And uh, by doing that, I think that what I did was is I had this, I, I kind of went to film school like uh, in a matter, in a short amount of time because I was basically working on set and working on a desk and also working in the edit and I was working with a camera crew and I was working with the grip and electric and this is stuff like you know you would just do whatever they asked you to do yeah um, and kind of um, with the idea that if I did whatever uh, I could to help them that they would then pretty much give me some sort of knowledge or on uh, on their process interesting um, now, how old were you at this point? What, what age were you? Right out of school, so I was probably like 23. Okay, okay. Two. Yeah. And um, and then I got, uh, and I was basically like, the first thing was driving a forklift uh, at a lot of Universal. <laughs> nice. And uh, just picking up trash. Yeah. And, um, and then I like, that's when I started to basically like, go to different departments and, and figure out, you know, what they were doing. I mean, really like I had, I had done a bunch of uh, film programs at school and theater programs and that kind of stuff. But, uh -huh. um, really being on the ground, I think is, 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 is pretty valuable. Um, and so then I finally got, you know, fast forward a little bit, this 30,000 foot, I got, uh, onto an executive producer's desk. And while I was on his desk, I basically also moonlighted for all of his shows. So yeah. I was a PA for all the shows. And then, so like from, you know, anywhere from like, you know, 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. I was on the show and then from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. I was on his desk and then from you know 10 p or 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. I was on the show so, uh, doing everything from like yeah. logging and transferring footage transcoding um, you know writing scripts that I could um, do and, and, and things like that and um, and just learning I mean I think that that's mm. the thing I think that a lot of people don't necessarily I think that they're they know that if they go through a certain process if they go they, hey if I you know if I have a PA then I'm gonna eventually just move up or if I'm gonna get on someone's desk or if I'm gonna go to the mail room I think my thought was is like I I I hope I, I hope I move up but I also want to get as much knowledge on every single floor that I can yeah um and uh and then you know he started to let me do more stuff. It was like, hey, do you know how to work a camera? I was like, sure. And I just went out and, you know, shot some stuff for him, uh, which is what we call now Sizzles. And um, two of the shows that he had me go out and shoot Sizzles for, uh, those got picked up for series. And, and then I went and did a short film. And then I came back and helped uh, them produce uh, that one of the series once it went uh, into production. And then um, I realized, you know, fast forward a little bit that like there was going to be a need for high quality content that a lot of the big places 
wouldn't be able to monetize specifically like the place that I was at. Interesting. At the time. And I also knew a lot of people in the ad space as well. So, you know, and this idea that short form was starting to kind of like play a role in short form, but not 30 second spots, but more like- Yeah, right, right, right. Mm. And so I was like, well, what if I just take that not, you know, and, and, and the idea being that like, all these bigger companies wouldn't be able to monetize it because like what's you know they can't do something for yeah 20, it's not worth it right ten thousand mm-hmm. hours to, you know and i think that like so i just you know went and got like uh rented a house and and saved a bunch of money and then went and um bought like a prosumer camera and uh you know a, an editing software for a mac and a uh, three-point lighting system mm-hmm. a couple uh sennheiser mics and just became a one-man shop um, and did that for several years. You know, I built out a little editing thing. Once we got a little bit, you know, once we had a couple more jobs, I built out an editing bay in the garage. And, mm. um, and then um, I started to just do stuff for like, you know, 500 bucks, 250 bucks, whatever basically I could just to build some sort of portfolio. Um, and, uh, and then slowly but surely once quote unquote digital, meaning, you know, YouTube and those places, um, started to do more content uh, after there was a recession, there was a recession in between there, but um, they started to uh, do more content. I was kind of the person that was around doing, it. you know, I was, mm. I was able to do it at a certain price point. Um, and, uh, and then it kind of took off a little bit from there. Um, and so we started to like, you know, we did, you know, the original programming for, you know, Yahoo and AOL and Vivo and Maker and full screen and, uh, you know, fast forward to, go 90 and to YouTube premium. So we've always kind of been at the forefront of uh, creating content uh, based on places that uh, we know that there is a need for quality content. And a lot of that content, regardless of where it lives in its first run, generally has space for it outside of where it usually is, if that makes sense. Yeah. So. That's kind of the thirty thousand foot view. I mean, I think now the company is pretty diversified in terms in terms of the four buckets of content. That's features, traditional television, you know, the digital space, meaning the digital space is still meaning you know the YouTube ish places, mm-hmm. um, and like uh, you know, uh, we're still doing a lot like for like Bleacher Report, you know, right. Snapchat, and those kind of places, and then still heavily involved in brand and content. So. Um, so it just is, it's very much like uh, we've now expanded into the four buckets pretty evenly. And now it's a full fledged content creation company that's doing it all in house. So are these big brands, you mentioned like Bleacher Report, are they like contracting your company out because internally they, that kind of creating that kind of content that you're trying, like I'm trying to think of an example of what something you would do would look like. And this is me being completely naive about the industry yeah. that you, you play in, right? I knew nothing about that world. Well, it's like you know. I think Bleacher is in an, it. Bleacher is an interesting um, is an interesting one, and that is because they have a really they have a core audience that is pretty large and robust. It's kind of sure. like it's a it's different than ESPN. Yeah. Um, and so it's like well, and they were already doing some really good content on there. Prim- a lot of animation stuff, but really really good content, really funny stuff, short form, and so. You know, the idea being that, like, how do we create content for that audience mm. that that audience can consume? And then how do we, so that we can build an audience or piggyback that audience uh, by giving them content that they are wanting to digest and then wanting to be ambassadors for? And then where else can that live, that content live? Um, so I think that that's kind of this, it's, I always look at content with several different prongs. It's like I did a series uh, called Junketeers that Lexus uh, and L Studios underwrote and that Comedy Central and under Viacom Velocity uh, ended up distributing to all of their channels and socials and all that stuff. <clears throat> and throughout that whole process, even in the beginning in the scripting phase, we were coming up with ways that we could build out ancillary content um, that wouldn't feel like, oh, this is just something that we're pulling right. from the edit. Um, and so that's always been the idea is like, we want to think of content in as much of an entrepreneurial way as we can. Yeah. And I think that like, 
and that goes into the marketing side as well, right? So it's like, what what kind of assets do we think that we can be able to prematurely understand that there's going to be places that is going to want this content, and let's really give them exclusive content that we're actually going into the shoot and knowing we're going to make for those places. So like that particular series, we had you know exclusives on you know and and Vogue um, and Entertainment Weekly and a bunch of uh, other places and I might be or the rap and um, just Jared and deadline and so on and so forth um, sure so that's always been kind of the, at the at the core of kids at play is this idea of that's the name you're coming right kids at play yeah yeah I don't think you said that I just want to make sure people knew that yeah sorry I just went on sorry just, <laughs> you're good man you're good yeah, yeah. Anyway. sweet so let me ask you this I think there's a lot of people that kind of find themselves in a, a somewhat similar situation to, to what you were in, um, in that they know they want to do something in this field, right? Uh, maybe they don't know exactly what that is. Maybe they in, in, intend to start a business in this space. I have a, I, I've, I have a few people that came on the show that were into fashion, right? So what they do, they went and interned with some of the big like fashion brands to learn the industry because they didn't really entirely know where they saw themselves fitting or Better yet, they didn't even know if they actually wanted to be an entrepreneur. They just kind of wanted to play in that space, which it sounds like is your situation. I don't think you yeah. intended, hey, I didn't go into this being an entrepreneur. I just really like film, right? So talk about the benefit of you just rolling up your sleeves, immersing yourself in that learning, becoming, so, so to speak, like a jack of all trades, and then how that served you in what you're doing now, just kind of knowing everything. Because I would presume there's no way you could be doing the work you're doing now had you not done that work prior to, to you know, starting any of the business ventures that you started thereafter. I think that you're a hundred percent right. I mean, I think that like, that's what it comes down to. I mean, for me, it's, I've always taken the aspect of like, I like to, I like to work and I like to physically work. Yep. You know, I like to also just get my hands there. I like to know every yeah. department. I like to like, um, I like to understand the ins and outs. I mean, I still go to set and still go to department heads and kind of like get into there, you know, oh, what are you thinking here? What are you, you know, yeah. not, trying to uh taking off an executive producer and a company owner hat and still kind of like getting to know what are new things that they're doing and what are they figuring out why you know why this lens as opposed to that one you know what is you know it's like why you know this light what's this light gonna do to our scene you know and what you know yeah. what is the dp looking for or it's like um and i really I take pride in that and I think that that's part of what I love about my job now is, is that now I can look at it from a different perspective and, and look at it from more about like, I'm now looking to hire the, the people that are so far ahead of me in, in their particular lane. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like what a lot of people, I think the smart thing, at least in my opinion is, is to try and just consume as much as you can. Yeah. Um, and, and try and like, you know, here's the other thing too is like, don't be afraid to like piggyback people. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid to like go up and say, Hey, look, I'm not going to bother you, but like, is there any way that like I can shadow you for a day or can I, you know, Hey, can I sit down with you for 20 minutes? 90% of the time people are going to be like, sure, absolutely. Like, and this is you know within I mean? your, this is within your like work environment, right? Or just anybody for that matter. Anybody, I think anybody, I think, I think that that's the thing. I think that that's the thing that I always did was I just asked, you know, and I think that like, you know, when you were talking about the person in fashion, it's like, you don't know until you actually ingratiate, you know, ingratiate right. yourself into that stuff. And I think right. that it's important that you, I mean, you try and learn as much as you can, yeah. uh, cause then you're going to find out what you really want to do. Right. You know, and I think that like, that's, that's super important, at least in my opinion, at least for me, that's what that was very important. Yeah. I think entrepreneurs, you know, we have this big grand vision sometimes of, of where we see ourselves and sometimes it's, it, it feels vague and abstract. And I think it's difficult to kind of see like, okay, what's the next viable step that I need to take to get closer to this goal, right? right. And, and my wife says this, and I swear to God, I'm a trademark it for her, but she says clarity doesn't strike, it unfolds, right? And you don't know. So I think people sit on the sidelines, not knowing exactly or being able to define what it is they ultimately want to be able to do. But I think that unfolds over time, right? That unfolds you doing right. the work, learning the trade, learning the environment learning the the field that you're wanting to play in right and so anyway it, you, you are a notable example i think of many that i've seen that have done just that and it's really been kind of a i think i think the reason jason that they they people don't like that that path is that it feels like i'm not being an entrepreneur i'm getting a job but i would say this i would look at it more as an internship it's a paid internship to 100%. then go launch your business 
you are 100% right. The other thing too is like, look, I think that as an entrepreneur or somebody wanting to be an entrepreneur, I think that you have to take your ego out of it. Yes. I think it's like, totally. I, you know, I think that that's a big thing. It's like, yeah. I still will go to set and if it's like, if we're running out of time or whatever, I will still grab sandbags and still help load <laughs> the truck. And you know, like yeah. the thing for me is like, you, no job is too small yeah. if you're an entrepreneur. And if yeah. you own, and if you, if you have these grandiose things of like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, sit in a, you know, this high rise, and I'm gonna be in the corner office, and everyone's gonna answer me. Well, then you better believe that you're gonna have to put your ego aside, yeah, on a daily basis, and understand that like, when the going gets tough, everybody turns to you, and it's like, well, you know, it's like, the toilet's flooding. It's like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Call Jason. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's like, his that's building. Kind of, it's exactly right. Like, what do you, you know what I mean? And so it's like, you have to have that mentality. Yeah. Uh, at least in my, no, no, totally agree. All right. I wanted to, I want to touch on that, man. Cause yeah. I feel like that was really important. I, I, think, yeah. I think it's sometimes difficult for people when they see somebody like yourself that has, that you've built this, this company to where you are more of the guy in the corner office now. And I don't think they, they see the steps and the building blocks that, that you took to get to that point, right? We see the after effect. We see the tip of the iceberg, yeah. so to speak, right? So I always like to give people yeah. that perspective of what it took to actually get to there. I think you're hundred percent right. And I think that we all kind of look at those people and we kind of say, oh, you know, it's either like, oh, well, you know, he did it, why can't I do it? Or she right. did it, why can't I do it? Or look at them, you know, they don't, or maybe they, you have this feeling like that they don't deserve it and you deserve it. Mm. And I think the thing is though, is that like, even to this day, there's not a moment that goes by that I'm not, you know, um, thinking or somehow concerned about some aspect of the business. It's not like, it's not like it's all, uh, and I'm just being real. I think that like the bigger you get, the bigger the, more, the problems. I mean, you know, it's the more like, shit you have to worry about. Right. And, and you know, the other thing too is, People just think that money solves everything. But dude, when you get bigger, the decisions get more costly. When you make a bad decision, you're like, holy shit, that costs us $150,000. Exactly. You know? It's like Biggie said it the best, more money, more problems. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> that is it. I mean, it really is. It's like the bigger you get. Yeah. And then the other thing too is, it's like if you're, if you know, to scale, you have to, you know, you worry about scaling and then you go through that whole thing about like, well, how do I scale, you know, without selling my business off or do yeah. I sell part of my business? Do I not? You know what I mean? I think that like Stuff. those things just like, you're never going to feel unless eventually you have a buyout or whatever. And you're like, I'm, over, I'm done. You know I mean? Right. Um, like you've, you know, you had a, a, a scenario that, right. you know, uh, and like, I'm going to do something else. Right. And I think that like you, but you never feel content i don't think in the sense of like there's always something no matter what no matter how big you are or mm -hmm. even at the sense of it's like the problems you know your your problems will always be there your issues your i should say your obstacles will always be there mm -hmm. it just is a matter of um uh what type of problems what are, you want them to be obstacles right there yeah 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 interesting dude so one of the things i noticed when i did when i was doing research on you is you're kind of viewed upon as like an early adopter, so to speak, right? And so I guess it seems like you were kind of the perfect age coming up and then starting, you know, your own thing with content and stuff like that of the digital era, right? Of like the YouTubes and stuff like that. So here's the deal, man. This is what I'm really curious to talk to you about. I see we, my wife and I both work with students and clients alike every day that what we call them is chasing shiny objects, right? It's yeah. like, oh, this next platform or this, like right now it's LinkedIn or TikTok or whatever, right? And so they find themselves just bouncing from one platform to the next, never really staying like true and committed to one specifically, right? It's just always whatever is the big hype thing. So AKA shiny objects. So how did you have, or what do you do, I should say, to kind of have the foresight, a gut feel, or some kind of analysis that you do to recognize this is a big player and I need to be present on this platform, so to speak, like it was a YouTube or whatever platform yeah. was where you started to build content. Uh, and then what kind of criteria do you use to assess? Is this a fly by night thing? Or is this here to stay for the long haul? That's a, it's like, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I think that like, for me, I, I will say that, you know, I want to make, I've always just, how do I, I'm just gonna say it's like I just want to make cool shit, cool. and I want to make cool shit, and yeah. I want to make cool shit, and I don't really care where it lives. Interesting. As long as the audience is the right audience for the content. I love it. And so, 
for me, it's like, it's less about finding the shiny object and it's more about like looking at it from an analytical standpoint. I mean, part of the reason why I started the company also was, is that we could and put everything in house from like an editorial and camera and, you know, production in house was, is that I knew that if I, the more and more content that I did digitally, that, that was, let me just say digitally, meaning away from the Nielsen ratings, that I would have real time analytics so that I could adjust Which potentially what I want, you know, in real time. I could just walk into the other bay and be like, hey, listen, you know, we need to favor the uh, antagonist in the scene because it feels like, you know, they're not really buying into the protagonist. Mm. So we would just be able to change it and cut it, and, you know. Uh, How did you know that though? How did you know that through the analytics, through the data? Well, because you would be able to, like, you'd be able to see the drop offs in terms of ah. what happened. And so, so that was for me. And so it's like, for me, in terms of that stuff, it's it's less about looking at the shiny objects and looking at like, okay, look, here's a piece of content. Now, where 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 would this content for me, where, where would this content be great for? So in kind of like when we just launched the show uh, or we're about to, the, the series is about to launch this week, actually, for Bleacher Report, we're talking about it. It's like, well, the content was perfect for that platform. Mm. And so it's like, and the same thing was, uh, you know, in a lot of the series that we've done is like the content in like the series that we did for Yahoo back in the day and for AOL and Vivo and those things, it was like, it was more about searching out that particular platform after we had thought about the content. Okay. So it's analysis, analyzing the audience, figuring out what content works best for that specific audience, and then analyzing the data to assess hey, this is working or this is not working. Correct. Got it. Okay. And, and the idea being like, let's say, let's say that you and I, you know, it's like you and I come up with an idea and we're like, look, this is a great idea. We love it. Who's it for? Okay. It's probably for so-and-so. It's for this demographic. It's, you know, uh, millennial moms, right? So it's like, okay, where are, where are millennial moms? What type of millennial mom are we looking at? What type of demographic are we looking at? And where are those, where are those millennial moms living? Right, where, mm. where are they living in the day to day? You know, they're, you know, interesting. Is, is it a, is the millennial mom watching daytime talk show? No, because millennial mom is out doing stuff or she's working or what have you, right? So is she kind of getting her, getting her content more at night or is she, you know, after, you know, she's worked all day and maybe she's, you know, had dinner, or whatever. And then figuring out what platforms and outlets are adhering to that type of mentality and that type of viewership um and data and then going after those type of platforms um because it's like and i think that so studying that in a way but it's really starting out with the content it's like this is this is a really good piece of content and i don't look at content as like well let me just go to you know these broadcasters and these streamers and this you know i look at it like well this also could be great for pepsi mm. you know let me let me call it pepsi let me you know or this could be great for a brand and uh and then figuring out well is this you know does this just work for the brand or does it also potentially work for a platform or streamer or network or broadcaster but also work for the brand and how can we bring those two together so um it's a lot of analyzing that type of stuff um which i think is fun to do you say something really important, man. And I think it's that you don't care where it goes. You just want to know that where it's going is going to serve the people that are on that platform. Right. Yeah. And so Instagram right now is one of those for us where it's like everybody and their grandma's like, I got to be on Instagram. And it's like, but why? Right. And right. in some, in some cases it doesn't make sense. Let's say they sell, uh, it's like a, a middle-aged woman who sells these little trinkets or something, right? Like Instagram is not maybe your jam then. Probably Facebook. Pinterest is your jam yeah, or Facebook Pinterest, is Facebook. your jam. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so I think too many people focus on where, not the what and the who, right? Like this is what I sell and this is the people I sell it to and this is where those people hang out. More so, more importantly than anything else. That's it. I mean, that really, you, you said it cor totally correctly. I mean, we did a daytime talk show uh, called Me Time with Frangela and we had a lot of social interactivity and it was like a conversation because everyone's like oh instagram instagram and this and that and we we're like well the demo that this is going to be airing to is on facebook yeah. and twitter so those are the ones that we need to keep tailor you know right. most of our put most of our energy uh towards i think you're 100 percent right it's like are you are you and that's people just going after the shiny object well 
do you want to be successful or are you just trying to, you know what I mean? Or are you just going after this shiny object? Right. And, and to me, it's like, I want to, I want to get ambassadors of the content. Right. And I'm not going to, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what you want. You want ambassadors of your brand. I mean, and, it's like, and here's the deal too, Jason, on that note is we only have a very limited view of these platforms because our perspective tells 100%. us Instagram is huge. Dude, any of them are huge. Like they are all enough for you to make a very viable living. 100%. Not get extremely wealthy, right? Like You're uh, so right. Like, like it's crazy, but we just, we, we place them in order and we just assume, well, Twitter's well, compared to Instagram. And it's like, Twitter is still massive. Like massive. still massive platform. Massive. Like, you know what I mean? So, so Abs absolutely all, you, you, yeah, you're so right. Now, one of the things I will say though, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, is I recommend for anybody, and this is maybe contingent upon what this content is for, but I like to be at least, whether I repurpose or whether I have some ability to have one of my content distribution platforms be heavily involved with search, right? So it totally. lives, so like YouTube, I love with YouTube because we just started YouTube a few months ago. We were just doing the podcast. Here's the problem. There are very limited search functions on podcasting, right? So we have to use other means to drive new viewers to the podcast platform to listen to this show, right? Versus people searching on their podcast app. I want to learn about how to uh, learn where I should post my content, right? Like YouTube, people search that way. Podcasts, they don't, right? Oh, so. Yeah. I sometimes think, okay, you need to really diversify. You need to be have something on search so that you continue to build your audience. Does that play into your world or no? A hundred percent. And I think that's I think that's totally smart. And, and it totally does. I mean, that's the thing is like we want a presence in a lot of places. And I think it's like, you know, and it just it's almost like the mothership. Where's the mothership living? And then where's your presence elsewhere coming? Right? Interesting. And I Interesting. think that like you you said it best. I mean, it's like you still want some sort of presence in these places. And like for you, it's like, well, searchability. So what's the, what are the places that are gonna be best for my searchability? So I, I, I think that that's, I think you have to think that way. And especially you need to think that way as an entrepreneur. It's funny, um, man, we did a, we did a test and I, I started blogging on specific episodes that we did just to kind of create more searchable content around the podcast. This was like a couple years ago and I was really experimenting with it. And what we found was, the, the episodes that had the most downloads were the ones that coincided with the blog because totally. people got on Google and they look for how to fill in the blank, found my piece of content. We embedded the podcast player in the blog itself. And that was driving new users or new listeners to the Genius. show. Exactly. Right. Boom. So, Love so Love it. I think sometimes people don't, they think A to B, but sometimes this game is much longer than that, right? Like sometimes 100%. you really have to connect a lot of dots together. You have to have a, a holistic marketing approach, not just, well, I'm putting out content. It's a good, no, no, no. You've got to think further than that. You've got to think, Absolutely. what does this platform do? How does it serve? Who does it serve? And how do I drive more people to it? Or how do I use these other mediums to continue to drive what I'm doing and how do they all interconnect it? Absolutely. I think that is such a great point. And I, and I couldn't agree more with, with that philosophy. I and mean, I think it's like, and especially when you're thinking about, you know, the uh, marketing aspect, because it's really about like, you, as an entrepreneur, you, you're continually trying to figure out how do I get, how do I market my brand as most, as cost efficiently and as, and as, and as uh, effectively as possible. And I think that those are some of the things that you just have to do. You have to look at it from a holistic approach. You have to consistently be reading about what are some of the things that I can do, even if it's trial and error, if you're like, listen, you know, here's something that, like is going to get, you know, 10,000, you know, there's not a lot of users on it, but, but you might find that those users are, are, are folks that can be really sticky to your brand. And right. it's like, that is a big deal. That's like those people. And it's like those people that trickle out to other people. And those That's people trickle out to other people. You know what I mean? I don't give a um, shit if you have a hundred thousand Instagram followers, if none of them are becoming customers and consuming your content. It doesn't well, matter. It doesn't matter. That's I'd rather exactly have a thousand right. on Twitter that are. That's exactly right. <laughs> and that, That's the, ex those are just arbitrary examples. I'm not saying that that is the ratio of no. customers. No, but it was a random example, yeah. No, but you're right though. I mean that 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 is it. Like, you know, you're looking for stickiness and that's the yeah. that's the that's the thing. And I think it's like so you can't just like all of a sudden launch something on Instagram or YouTube and be like, Oh, it's gonna you know, it's yeah. gonna just, you know, it's gonna speak for it's you know, it's just gonna all of a sudden get hundreds and hundreds of millions of views. I think you have to take this holistic approach that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and that's what we try and do whenever we are thinking about even, you know, when we go into and, and talk to a place. 
we are already thinking about like where are the other tentacles that this content will live and what does that content look like and where are we placing this certain type of content um in order to drive back um in order to drive back a, a potential audience to it okay so um, what so give me an example then if, if you're if you're able to if you're not able to if it's like secret sauce kind of stuff don't tell me or if it's like you know really confidential stuff but give me an example of this was something we worked on these were like the type of conversations we had this is how we assessed our market and this is what we were able to deduce from that that analysis yeah so um well i think that like probably the one that's that's out that i was i mentioned before which is this chunk of tears series for comedy central that we that lexus nail studios helped fund and, and comedy central distributed our idea was is that and it was around celebrity junket circuit and basically like we had a cast of a cast of correspondents that were interviewing celebrities in hotel rooms and you know on set and all that kind of stuff and just chaos would ensue. It was basically a workplace comedy. But going into it, we were like, we need to basically create and have people on the show and create content that we can exclusively send out to several different markets and I'll explain those markets to hopefully drive traffic back to the show. And so when it launched, we had uh, you know, every episode that launched, there was a corresponding, um, there's a, a, a corresponding PR exclusive to it. Mm. And there was a corresponding, um, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And, uh, I actually think Pinterest where the celebrity that was being interviewed, we gave them content that they could basically drive, um, that they could post. Like for example, when we did Eli Roth, we created a fake trailer for him that he posted on his Instagram account and his Facebook account that all of a sudden, all of the horror fans were like, oh my God, what is this um, mm -hmm. trailer for his new film that he's coming out? And that in turn drive, drove that audience back to our show. Interesting. You know, um, we had Matt Balmer on and um, we had, and. Uh, you know, we we created content for him to put on on all of his socials, which were definitely different than his than um, the areas that Eli Roth uh, sure. were were using, and those and then had an exclusive on uh, I think his was maybe Deadline or Reporter or Entertainment Weekly something like that, um, and uh, and so and then at the same time, what we did even before it launched, we had. Um, one of our correspondents before even, I mean, it was probably like a, a month and a half away. We, we wanted to create equity for the characters before it ever came out. And so what we did was we placed one of our correspondents on a red carpet and um, we set it up so that Kristen Bell slapped the correspondent on the red carpet. Mm. And uh, so we, <clears throat> Uh, I think it was called, I think the, the red carpet was boss or, uh, something like boss. Um, but anyway, but so the idea was, is that if she slaps him, this is what we thought about before we even did it. And, and is that if she slaps him, we're on the red carpet that hopefully other outlets will then turn and be like, oh my gosh, hmm. she, she just slaps, Kristen Bell slaps somebody. And when she slapped him, a bunch of media outlets turned and flipped their cameras and it was a lot of experimental marketing but turned their cameras and so it was on that clip it was all was staged on. the whole thing <clears throat> yeah we, we, we were just hoping that basically that this would happen but the idea being that like just jared then immediately it was like just jared's biggest video he yeah. posted it entertainment week entertainment tonight did you know so true or so false That's um crazy. and so what we were trying to do was is it basically just completely encompasses like you're saying a holistic approach to it right it's like what you know how can we create um conversation and chatter in multiple in multiple places so it was a very it, the tentacles were very broad and, yeah. and wide in that but very very strategic you know um so that's i think that that's kind of a good example we've kind of taken that approach to a lot of things um that we do here that's crazy i, I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make when it comes to to marketing is they don't realize the time and the effort and the the in-depth like like if you look at it as an onion they, they only go to like the first few layers of their marketing approach right and it's like dude you got to keep when you keep digging deeper and deeper that's where the good stuff really lies 
you're hundred percent right. I mean, that's the, that, that's it. I mean, like you were just talking about with the blog, yeah. it's like, oh, well, geez. All, that makes, all these are it now, just makes all the sense in the world, right? You're like, okay, well, oh, well, why don't I put a link to it in the blog? Right. Boom. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. you constantly are like, okay. And, and, and you're only going to figure those things out by trial and error. You know what I mean? That's mm. the other thing too. I think that a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, look, a, as you know, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, failure is, failure is like not this, it's, it's like this thing you deal with every day. Right. Every day, every right. day, especially in my business, every day, 99% of the day, sure. all I hear is no. It's like, no, oh, pass, no, 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 no. And it's like, if you're not, if you're not willing to say to yourself, you know what? I'm gonna take, uh, I get that I'm gonna get no a lot or I'm gonna fail a lot and, I, and this is what I'm gonna do to get back up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, and there's no harm in it. It's just as like, maybe you're a better position to not be someone that is like, gonna consistently get that. I mean, I think that like, um, and it is a lot of trial and error. Had you not thought, oh, let me just try doing this blog. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, and putting and putting that link in there, it's like, well, I think there's a level of not, I think there's a level of being fearless. Yeah. Helps. Interesting. Okay. So another thing we hear a lot, and this is going to be straight, you're the perfect person to ask this question to Jason, because there are guys like you that are building these massive audiences on these various platforms that are non-traditional, like you said, getting away from Nielsen outlets. And it raises the bar of what is, my wife and I were talking about this the other day, some of these like shows for kids on YouTube now, are so like the production value is so high that it legit I, if i'm nickelodeon or, or disney I'm, I'm scared shitless right because yeah. it's so good it, it, it rivals i think and now with the digital age that we live in kids are so used to playing on this thing for those listening yeah. I'm, I'm referring to my cell phone that i there for the statistics show that people are kids are now more adept they know how to use a phone they don't even use like a tv remote right like they're just or vc or a you know dvd player or something totally. um so as the world kind of migrates over and you see creators like yourself that are putting out just grade a content online it puts a lot of pressure on let's call them independent or, or young entrepreneurs or, or creators that want to get into the space that are nervous about it because they're like holy shit, i could never do what jason's company is doing with the with the quality of the content they're putting out what would you say to those people well yeah i mean i, I think you're never gonna you're never gonna get there until you start trying to get there i mean it's like you know i think that the i think you you know those people had to start somewhere as well that sure. are, are creating that stuff i think that that's the you know it, it sounds like an easy answer but i really do believe that i mean you know the point of entry now is changed quite dramatically. I mean, I think that we went through a whole phase that everybody could just produce content. Yeah. And I think now it's like, well, now you got to produce content that's going to cut through the chaos and the clutter. And you know, yeah. it's like high value quality content is always going to rise to the top. You know what I mean? I think that we went through a whole phase where it's like a, you know, user generated content you just see was like the rage. And it's like, yeah, well, that's, that that's a form of content but i think that now when you're looking at all these shows yeah i mean the bar is 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 high now but i think it's also like it's still attainable um yeah. because i think that everybody's going to want fresh voices yeah. everyone's going to want a new uh a, a new piece of content that's going to um uh you know be imaginative and 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 be fun and entertaining so i think that like you just have to really kind of uh understand that People are always looking for new voices, and if you don't get out there and, and, and start making stuff, then I, you know, you're, yeah, you're never gonna get there. Yeah. Well, that's good advice. I I would add probably to that as an example of something I saw the other day. Uh, a friend of mine asked me. He said he sent me a video, and it, it is the dumbest shit I have ever seen. It is so stupid. <laughs> it is the worst YouTube video, and it has like 12 million views. I mean, it is just god awful but here's the deal he was like do you believe there's a such thing as bad content and i was like i think that that concept when you have a limited when you have a limited space right like there are a certain amount of tv hours in the day and that's what we have available to us then yes there's a criteria of good and bad content but when we live in this vastness of infinity that is youtube because there's no limitation as as to how much content we could upload i don't think that exists anymore because now you're going to find that there's these niches that exist 
that were yes. never even thought of before. I 100% right? agree with you. So you just have to niche down and find, again, it goes back to what you said before about finding your people, right? But niche down and find your 10 million people that want to watch this ridiculous, terrible video that I watched. I'm obviously not of the 10 million that it cared about that video, right? But can you imagine the revenue that was generated? Now, I know YouTube has gotten, YouTube specifically has gotten a little bit more difficult when it comes to actually yeah. paying out their users. And I know that's a huge thing that we don't have time to get into today, unfortunately. Um, but it still gives I, you a path to monetization to have that many views on a video. And there were multiple videos all in the millions, including his own channel, had millions of subscribers. I think you're totally right. I think that that's it, right? It's like, and if you kind of think about it, like, and you look at from the now, let's just say that let's look at cable and streaming and some of these places. Well, if you look at cable, you know, uh, traditional cable and broadcast, there are, they all have filters, right? It's like, right. it's like, this is the lane that I'm going. This is the lane that we're going for. It's like comedy central. This is the type of comedy we're doing, you know, True right. TV, this is the type of comedy we're doing. You know, it's like TBS, this is the type of, you know, um, program we're doing this, is, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think that like, you know, it's the same thing goes for AMC and, you know, sci-fi and stuff like that. It's like, there, there are audiences, like you said, I don't know if there is bad content now because somebody's gonna really like that type of content. And, and like, how are, are we to judge that content? It's just, as, it's, it's our opinion, it's our personal right. opinion, but there is an audience probably for most, for almost anything. I mean, it's all know, paradoxical. Uh, it depends on the lens that you view it through. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. I couldn't agree more with that. I think that that's, and I think that, like you said, I mean, I, I I think that that's what we've kind of based our business on this idea that like we're gonna we want to make cool shit but we want to make the shit that we want to watch and where right. and, and then certain things are you know where does that particular stuff live uh, um and finding out that particular uh, yeah niche i think the other thing too man is when it gets more challenging or when the competition gets more stiff or when you know uh, the, another example is facebook is really getting a little bit more difficult with how they allow you to to display advertisement right so yeah. your above text header can only be three lines it used to be able to be five you can't do a below uh graphic headline anymore like that can't exist and and my wife and i were talking about it this was just happened last night we were like you know what we view those as a good thing like let's frame this as a positive because it means it's going to weed out that many people that are doing bad marketing, right? Because they're not 100%. gonna have success with it anymore. So only the good marketers will be able to take advantage of this new way of doing it on that particular platform. And that applies to any platform, not just Facebook. I 100% agree with that. I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. I think the other thing too is like, it'll, it'll weed those people out. And the other thing I will say about, about also just your competition and uh, a little bit on uh, taking us, uh, pivoting a little bit is that I think you, I think, for me is is like i like to see my competition do well because that's a, that tells me that in the marketplace is in it exactly you know what i mean yeah exactly. so it's like i don't want to know that like somebody that i that's a competitor is now out of business like that does me yeah. no good um yeah. you know i think it's more like you know uh, so no i totally agree and, and i don't think there's any situation that an audience says, well, I already have this, so I'm not gonna watch this, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there's not oversaturation in people, there's not too much going on, right? But- 100%. People, more variety is always a good thing to to an extent, right? Having more options Absolutely. or more things. You know, like, I, I, I totally think that that's not, there's never time when you're like, I have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, thus I'll never wanna eat anything else anymore, right? It's like, what, it's, that's 100%, would that right? ever, like, we I mean, don't think that way. And to go back to like, you know, this, this, feeling people feeling like there's the quality of content is so high it's like well yeah but that content is being made now and the, yeah. and the thing is is like you have to take some solace in the fact that like oh people are continually making that content which means that hey you can eventually start to make that content and right. there's a marketplace for that content right totally so i think that that is like take some take some solace in that that like that's a good thing yeah you know and well, not, and, and not think of it like there's no the cost of putting together really good stuff with the amount of tools and resources we have now has never been cheaper, easier to do. You know? I mean, that's right. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. And I think that like, well, and that's another conversation is, is yeah. like, yes, a, a, a lot of these outlets though are also looking for, they want that big, beautiful thing with a lot of great pieces of talent in front of them behind the camera. They want it for right. nothing. And, there are, and, you know, and once you get into it, you know, professionally done content versus amateur stuff like it's so it's so yeah, obvious it's, to it's, see right like it totally but, but to most people right like you could still doesn't we're not talking about we're talking about getting started right to get started 
you can have a quality looking product that, that before you couldn't yes. have access to, right? Yes, 100%. That's exactly, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, look, I started that way too. I mean, I just had a bunch of prosumer stuff. You know, um, and I think here's my here's my prosumer thing again. That's my it. Cell phone. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, and it's a great picture. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's a fantastic yeah. picture, and yeah. there's no reason why people that like if they want to be in that business, they shouldn't just go out and start making stuff with it because you just have it in your pocket. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. you look at these things like you know, um, uh, you know, it's like Twitch, right? Twitch is just like it's it's this it's yep. facetiming somebody. It's it. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like come on. Um, yep. So I think that like you you have access to all that stuff, and so a, there's no reason not to do it. Totally, totally yeah. agree, man. Cool, dude. So I gotta let you go. We got you for another two minutes. Um, but where can my audience go to support you? Uh, obviously, they, you've given a lot of value. Where can they go to support you guys and, and what you guys are? Kids at Play is the name of your company. Uh, yeah. So where can they go to support that? Look, I mean, we're 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 in the uh, the usual places, you know, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, the kids at play, um, and then uh, we got a, a, a great new series coming out uh, with the Bleach Report called Battle Stations, uh, where Sensor, four-time Call of Duty champion, uh, is uh, going and uh, checking out uh, some some big-time athletes uh, and their gaming setups, playing some playing some games with them, getting to know you know what uh, what got them started in gaming, and uh, so that's coming out uh, this week, uh, and. Uh, yeah, check out www.kidsatplay.com. So if they go to kidsatplay.com, will they be able to see all of the various pieces of content, all the projects you guys are working on? It's all yeah, you'll there. be able to, yeah, it, it'll be listed there and, and it'll point you in the right direction and um, yeah. Cool, That's all right that. guys, that link will be included whether it's you're watching or listening in the show notes or the description uh, below, you can check that out. And also, I, I guess, are you you're on Twitter as well, like your own personal handle, Jason yeah, or, or uh, Facebook? Yeah, Jason H. Berger. Jason H. Berger. All right, guys, that'll be yeah. included as well. At Jason, Jason H. Thanks. Berger, at the kids at play. What, what is it again? At the kids at play and at, the kids at, play. at Jason H. Berger. B -E -R -G -E -R. Got, it. Got it. All right, guys, those are included below. You can browse over and check Jason and kids at play. Jason, thanks for joining me, man. I, I really enjoyed this. I had a this blast. Was, yeah, this was awesome, man. I appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm myself. I'm going to go check out all the stuff you guys are doing and follow your content and come up with some, hopefully, some cool ideas of stuff that I can do too. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate it. I mean, it was uh, it was really good to talk to you. So I uh, thank you very much for having me. Awesome, brother. Brett. Ugh, I can't even speak now. Awesome, brother. All the best, buddy. <laughs> See you, man. You too. Bye-bye.